During the last several uh, weeks, we've been emphasizing faith, family, and flag. I preached a series of messages on faith, then some on family. And uh, this morning, I want to do this morning and tonight two messages on uh, our founding fathers. As you saw in the Sunday School DVD this morning, uh, the country has twisted the history. By the way, if you read the history of socialism and Marxism and things like that, uh, uh, they have to change history to make it say what they want it to say, not what it actually said, so that they can promote their present programs. Right. And of course, you are aware of that. But um, I want us this morning to look at the, the flag, I call it the flag series, and we're gonna look at the founders' beliefs a little bit, and I'll give you a scripture or a psalm in just a moment, but in frequent speeches from President Obama, when he was in office, he denied that America is a Christian nation and he did it over and over and over again. And even in Turkey, listen to what he said in Turkey. He said, we Americans do not consider ourselves a Christian nation or a Muslim, but rather a nation of citizens who, uh, his favorite word, uh, uh, are bound by a set of values. In June 2007, he told CBS again, whatever we once were, we're no longer a Christian nation, at least not just. We're also a Jewish nation, a Muslim nation, a Buddhist nation, a Hindu nation, and a nation of non-believers. The uh, representative for the New American Magazine said, note the progression in Obama's decline. In 2007, he said we're not longer just a Christian nation. Now in 2009, he says, we do not consider ourselves a Christian nation at all. Well, he should probably stop using the editorial we, I still consider it a Christian nation. Right. Since 1900, forces have been at work denying that Christianity had anything to do with founding the United States of America. In 1900, uh, two men went to Europe to look at the educational system there John Dewey and Horace Mann, and they came back and decided to take away the educational system and convert it into a re-socializing system funded by the federal government. So stri the stripping away of America's Christian founding, um, Horace Mann and John Dewey had a lot to do with. Removing any references they could attesting to Christianity. Their own writings over the last 100 years have either ignored or denied Christian values as having any part in the establishment of America. And as you saw this morning in the Sunday School uh, hour, if you watch the DVD, you saw we have not only uh, white Americans, but black Americans preaching and, and preaching the very principles that the Constitution uh, support. Mann and Dewey took over America's classrooms in order to become uh, re-socializers, making students fit in to the social system rather than teach them classic education. Columbia College, now Columbia University, became the number one training ground for inculcating the philosophies of uh, man and Dewey, and that would be education without the Bible. <clears throat> I think it was Martin Luther who said, educating students without the Bible is only making them more clever devils. Right. Russus John Rushdoony, a covenant theologian whom I came to know personally, when we sued the state of Kentucky over the right to have our Christian school. He made this statement to me in a private conversation. He said, Brother Goodell, education is basically religious, not secular. He then referred to numerous Bible references where instruction, teaching, and counseling were overseen in the Old Testament and New Testament by priests and pastors and apostles. And Dr. Rushdoony testified under oath in our 1974 court case, which went to the U.S. Supreme Court. By the way, God had to work hard on me to get me out of Kentucky up here, too. Now he couldn't get me out of here back to Kentucky. <laughs> so God, God does perform miracles. <laughs> George Williams, church historian, uh, leader at Harvard University, became a good friend of mine. And uh, he testified in our case in Kentucky as well. And his testimony was that the education that's being used today in the state of Kentucky, that was 1974, was simply inculcating uh, secular values and secular humanism, whereas whenever universities were established, particularly Harvard University, it was established as a tool for inculcating Christian principles on students 
from America's founding to the present in 1974. Uh, Harvard was established by Pastor John Harvard, and uh, they had one small building at first, and over the entrance to the building they had in the Latin language, veritas, as soon as you saw it, which is for life. And uh, Dr. Uh, Williams said that whenever students entered that, they understood that to refer to Jesus Christ, who is the giver of all life. Right. So Dr. Williams also affirmed that it was under attack by socialists, making the effort to eviscerate Christian principles completely out of the public schools, which he said are no longer public. They are simply statist institutions. So the question is, was America founded as a Christian nation, and did our founders intend for the Bible and its principles to be consistently taught in the schools of this country? The overwhelming democratic response to that, and recently President Biden reaffirmed it, no, no God, no religion in the public school. As early as George Washington's presidency, Focus on Christianity, its principles, and its founder, Jesus Christ, were central to education. Right. If you read David Barton's book, Original Intent, and I encourage you to do so, it's a long read, but it's worth it if you'll do it. Uh, we read this account, <clears throat> quoting now. Chiefs from the Delaware Indian tribe brought to General Washington three Indian youths to be trained in America's schools. In appreciation for what they had done and in response, Washington said, Chiefs, you do well to wish to learn our arts and our ways of life and above all the religion of Jesus Christ. Now, the modern politicians say that Washington was not a Christian. These will make you a greater and happier people than you are now. Congress will do everything they can to assist you in this wise intention. End of quotation. Modern historians sympathetic with the movement to remove every vestige of Christianity from American history, have claimed that all the founding fathers were either deists or simply non-Christians. The reality is 95% of all of the founding fathers, and that includes about 250, were either pastors, deacons, Sunday school teachers, or head of uh, Bible societies in the United States. These people who want to cast down Christianity and eviscerate the school system ignore the actual history, and they're certainly wrong to call George Washington a deist. In November of 1772, Samuel Adams and Richard Henry Lee responding to undue pressure from King George to increase injustices toward the colonists wrote something called the rights of the colonists as Christians the rights of the colonists as Christians. Their original goals, they stated, were as follows. Number one, to delineate the rights the colonists had as men, as Christians, and as subjects of the crown. Number two, to detail how these rights had been violated by King George. And then number three, to publicize throughout the colonies the first two items. <laughs> I like that, don't you? Sam Adams encouraged the colonists to study the scriptures in order to preserve their God-given rights. Listen to what he said in that, uh, that writing, the rights of the colonists as Christians. Quoting now, the rights of the colonists as Christians, these may be best understood by reading and carefully studying the institutes of the great lawgivers and head of the Christian church, which are to be found clearly written and promulgated in the New Testament. End of quotation. So these early evidences of our Christian roots are ignored, covered up, or denied by most of the modern dishonest historians. The goal to divest American history of all indicators of America's Christian heritage. So it's clear that President Obama got it all wrong, likely on purpose, to join the ungodly coalition seeking to divest America of its godly heritage. John Hancock, remembering the Boston Massacre, when British troops opened fire on Americans, wrote in 1774 on March the 5th, let us play the man of our God and for the cities of our God, end of quotation. What he sought to do was encourage the colonists to cheerfully submit to God's sovereign will. And he ended by quoting from Habakkuk chapter 3, 
verses 17 and 18. Here's what he said, quoting, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vine. The labor of the olive tree shall fail, and the fields shall yield not meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet we will rejoice in the Lord. We will joy in the God of our salvation. End of quotation. So the writings of our founders clearly show familiarity with both the Old and New Testament. And interestingly enough, when they quote the Old and New Testament, they don't take it out of context. They, what the application is fits the context. So the writings of our founders indicate that they believe that America should be founded upon biblical principles. And by the way, one of the arguments that's leveled against Christians is, well, if we have all these Christian principles and everything, that's violation of separation of church and state. Actually, violation of separation of church and state does not appear in the U.S. Constitution. Right. It only appears in a letter from Thomas Jefferson to the Danbury Baptist in which they were concerned about the First Amendment not being as strong as it should. And Thomas Jefferson wrote them back and said, I assure you that the way the First Amendment is written, it builds a wall of separation between the church and the state in order to protect the church right. from the state, yeah. not the way it's being used today. Right. So Hancock, uh, warning about tough times were ahead said that we will rejoice in the Lord, we will joy in the God of our salvation. Um, Mercy Otis Warren saw hard times coming and he offered this to the colonists. Listen to what he said. Let us be of one heart and stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And may he of his infinite mercy grant us deliverance out of all of these our troubles. In the quotation. Now, there's a verse that we often use, and that's kind of making a pivotal verse for all of these messages. Psalm 33, 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Psalm 33, 12. So when it became clear that King George was not relenting in his pressure on the colonists, the leaders said this, It was a natural idea that for harmonizing their measure, a Congress of deputies from each province should be convened to discuss these issues. From original intent, page 98. September the 5th, 1774, the first National Congress met in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to discuss the actions of King George. They met at Carpenter's Hall and uh, Mr. Uh, Reverend Mr. Duche opened in prayers at 9 a.m. John Adams wrote to his wife, Abigail. Abigail, Mr. Duche, unexpectedly by everybody, struck out into an extemporary prayer which filled the bosom of every man present. I must confess I never heard a better prayer or one so well pronounced. End of quotation. He said the prayer was fervent for Congress, for America, and for all of its provinces. Other members were deeply moved by Duchesne's prayer. Samuel Adams, Joseph Reed, Samuel Ward, Silas Dean, these were all present and responded to the reading of the prayer and of the scripture from the Psalter. In high church tradition, this passage, Psalm 35, was selected. So I want you to turn over to Psalm 35 and uh, <clears throat> we'll read, read from Psalm 35. Psalm 35, and we'll only read uh, verses 1 through 10, but it's my understanding that most of the psalm had been read in the entire first meeting of the United States Congress. Psalm 35, 1 through 10. Uh, Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for mine help. Draw out also the spear and stop the way against them that persecute me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. Let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion that devise my hurt. Let them be as chaff before the wind and let the angel of the Lord chase them. 
Let their way be dark and slippery, and let the angel of the Lord persecute them. For without cause have they hid. Uh, for without cause have they. Uh, read it again. For without cause have they hid for me their net in a pit, which without cause they have digged for my soul. Let destruction come upon him at unawares, and let his net that he hath hid catch himself into that very destruction. Let him fall. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like unto thee, which delivers the poor from him that is too strong for him, yea, the poor and the needy from him that spoileth him. I understood that they read the entire psalm. We'll stop with that. But the whole psalm applies to that day, September the 7th, 1774. John Adams again wrote to his wife, Abigail, Reverend Duchesne then read the lesson for the seventh day of September, which was the 35th Psalm. You must remember that was the next morning after we heard the horrible rumor of the cannonade of Boston. I never saw a greater effect upon our audience. It seemed as if heaven had ordained that Psalm to be read on that very morning under those very conditions, end of quotation. Then Adams advised his wife, I must beg you, Abigail, to read that psalm. Read this letter and read the 35th psalm to them, to your friends. Read it also to your father, end of quotation. So if Americans were given true American history, they would see that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Scriptures were integral from the very outset of the founding of this great nation. Right. It's moving away from the Scripture that's caused the problems we're facing today. When it became apparent that the British had landed in Boston, the Massachusetts legislature reminded its citizens with this. Let us be therefore altogether solicitous that no disorderly behavior, nothing unbecoming our characters as Americans, as citizens and Christians, be justly chargeable to us. End of quotation. So it was at this time under unjust threat from King George, that the Minutemen were actually formed. <clears throat> and by the way, they didn't have to have ordinances passed to determine when they could carry their guns. They were Christians. As Barton points out, and I quote from page 101 of Original Intent, often the men from a local church, and it was frequently a deacon, sometimes a pastor, who is responsible for conducting the military drills. Patrick Henry appeared before the Virginia House March the 23rd, 1775. Listen to his words. Although many loyalist voices urged calm and absolute submission, others like Patrick Henry cried for action. In his fiery speech before the Virginia House on March 23, 1775, Patrick Henry pro proclaimed the following. Shall we try argument? Sir, we've been trying that for the last 10 years. Our petitions have been slighted. Our remonstrances have produced additional violence and insult. Our suspicions and supplications have been disregarded and we have been spurned with contempt from the foot of the throne. An appeal to arms and to the God of hosts is all that is left to us. They tell us, sir, that we are weak, unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. Well, when shall we be stronger? Will it be next week or next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed and when British guards shall be stationed at every house? Shall we gather strength by irresolution and inaction? Sir, we're not weak if we make a proper use of those means which the God of nature hath placed in our power. Three millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty and in such a country as that which we possess are invincible by any force which our enemy can send against us. Besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations and who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone, it's to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war has actually begun. 
The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased that the price of chains and slavery forbid it, Almighty God? I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. These words came from an early warrior, peace-loving Christian man, but willing to take up arms to defeat those who were threatening Christian liberties. You see, the thing about our founding fathers, they knew and did abide by that Psalm 33, 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, <clears throat> the people whom he hath chosen for his inheritance. John Hancock felt that the urgency was there and that Patrick Henry was on the right course. So John Hancock, on April 15, 1775, witnessing the growing and ominous storm clouds of full-scale war coming from Britain, called Massachusetts to a day of prayer. He said, we need to pray, we need to fast, we need to ask for our God's intervention. And he explained it this way. In circumstances dark as these, it becomes us as men and Christians to reflect that whilst every prudent measure should be taken to ward off the impending judgments, all confidence must be withheld from the means we use and reposed only on that God who rules the armies of heaven and without whose blessing the best human counsels are but foolishness and all created power vanity. It is the happiness of his church that when the powers of earth and hell combine against it, then the throne of grace is of the earliest and easiest access. And its appeal, its appeal thither is graciously invited by that Father of mercies who has assured it that when his children ask bread, he will not give them a stone. That it be, and hereby it is recommended to the good people of this colony of Massachusetts as a day of public humiliation, fasting, and prayer to confess our sins, to implore the forgiveness of all of our transgressions, and especially that the union of the American colonies in defense of their rights, for which hitherto we desire to thank Almighty God, may be preserved and confirmed, and that America may soon behold a gracious interposition of heaven. Isn't that amazing? It's hard to read the actual words of the founding fathers. If you look at the modern history books, they don't quote the founding fathers. They just say what they believe the founding fathers stood for and believed and said. If you get a copy of the book Original Intent by David Barton, you'll find that instead of telling you what he thinks the founding fathers said, he just quotes them like I did here. The actual words of Samuel Adams, the actual words of Patrick Henry, the actual words of these people. And as you saw this morning in the DVD in the Sunday school class, the uh, black pastors and white pastors worked side by side in order to preach the principles that became foundational to the U.S. Constitution. America was founded as a Christian nation. One of the things that Benjamin Franklin said that was interesting, he said, America, and keep in mind, he was a deist. I don't think Benjamin Franklin ever trusted Christ as Savior. He became friends with George Whitfield, gave Whitfield hospitality when Whitfield came to Philadelphia to preach his great meetings. But on one occasion, Whitfield had stayed with Franklin, enjoyed the hospitality, wanted to come back to America. And he said, Mr. Franklin, I enjoyed your hospitality so much when I was there before. Would you please... Uh, allow me to stay in your home again for, which, uh, for, which, for, for Christ's sake, for Christ's sake. Benjamin Franklin wrote him back and he said, you're always welcome to share my hospitality here, not for Christ's sake, but for Whitfield's sake. So I don't think Franklin ever trusted Christ as Savior. But one of the things that stands out in, in their relationship is the two of them, as you well know, went to England in order to debate the tax, uh, taxation issue. So we had a fundamentalist Methodist preacher and a deist all going and speaking out in favor. You've got to be careful 
but you got to watch what people are saying. You got to make sure that you're not being told something that didn't actually happen, which is what's happening right now with the uh, various news outlets all across our country, as you well know. Well, Benjamin Franklin made an interesting statement. I'll close with this. He said he saw no conflict of interest in making sure that public schools in the state of Pennsylvania incorporated biblical teaching and Christian principles in all grade levels from the earliest to the latest. And he said, living by Christian principles is not the same as establishing a state church that we left when we left England. It's the Christian principles. It's not actually a church as such. Let's stand for prayer. Lord, we thank you for those who made great sacrifices. Most of the people who made sacrifices to help build this country died in poverty. Some died in prison. Some were executed because of their stand. Uh, some lost all of their property. Most of them were willing to pledge their fortunes and their lives to build this country. And now we find people who are not willing to pledge their fortunes in their lives taking advantage of the country. And we just pray that you would help us to keep our stand correct, stand on what the Word of God says, and to do what is right because it's right, not because it's popular. Speak to our hearts now as we open the altar, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.